give me the, give me the clip. Good morning. Good morning. I love it. I think we're on. Can y'all hear me? Can you not hear me? Wait, am I on? Yeah, I flipped. There it is. Good morning. It is wonderful to see you this morning. I am excited about what God has for us today. I can't wait to get to get into scripture, to get into the word. Um, a couple of things. I'm missing my sticky note. That is not good. Um, before we get started, you know, we had such, I just had this on my mind all week, we had such a beautiful um, baby dedication last week um, with that sweet little baby, but one of the things that Pastor said during that dedication was speaking of the baby, but he said, God has an expected end, and we always think of that when we think of babies, we always think of that with excitement and enthusiasm. But do you realize this morning that even as adults, that God has an expected end for us, that we have a destination called heaven and that we have a purpose in this life, this side of heaven. And so I was just really overwhelmed with that thought and it's just kind of stayed with me this week. And I just wanted to remind you this morning because sometimes this side of heaven life can be very challenging, can be very difficult. But we have to understand, and we're going to be reminded in Scripture this morning, that God indeed has an expected end for you and I. So, before we get started, any prayer requests, praise requests, uh, any, I always get that backwards, praise reports and prayer requests. I want to tell you again, thank you for your prayers for me this past week with my test. I'm going to ask you to pray for me one more time. Uh, this upcoming week, I have wrist surgery scheduled on Thursday. So if you would be in prayer that that will take care of the issues involved and that everything will go well with that surgery. Anyone else this morning? Kim, just continue to remember Kim. God is working on her behalf. Anyone else? Rob and Don, you're going to have to shout it because you're in my blind side over there. So when y'all got something to say, you're going to have to speak up. Yes, she's in rehab now, correct? Amen, amen. And today, those of you will celebrate. Um, this is La Costa's, Kim's daughter, Kim's daughter, Carol's daughter, uh, her 365 days of sobriety. She has been clean. God set her free in this very church. And so we celebrate that. Anyone else this morning? Amen. Amen. We appreciate our Facebook viewers. Anyone else? Yes, continue to remember, remember Peggy. She is in her home recovering, but she is still recovering. So pray for her. Sometimes um, recovery can be overwhelming, not only physically, but emotionally, because it just takes longer than we ever want it to. Anyone else? Brother Mark? Amen. Lift up the men in blue. Yes, sir. Anyone else, Callie? Yes, continue to remember Misty McBride. If you have not seen or heard, her brother did go to be with the Lord this week. And so uh, I know that that is a loss, but she has comfort in knowing it is a temporary loss. So we lift up that family. Anyone else? Stanley. Amen. Well, we are delighted to see y'all back this morning. We certainly have missed y'all. Anyone else? We're going to go to the Lord. Of Jerry. Amen. 
Anyone else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so thankful that we can gather in your name. Lord, let that never be a privilege that we take for granted, that we can freely walk through these doors and that we can worship you. I pray, Father, that you would just touch the needs that have been brought before you this morning, God. You know those that need healing. You know those, Father, that need situations worked out and circumstances. Father, that you are an on-time God. Father, sometimes we think that our waiting is in vain. Sometimes we think that we wait too long. Sometimes we think that the answer is never going to come. But let us be comforted this morning to know, Father, that you are still up on the throne, that you are still in charge, Father and that you are still working on our behalf, that you are working things out according to your plan and to your purpose, Father. I pray that you would move, Father, mightily in our midst today. Father, I ask, and even in Sunday school as we are studying your word, Father, Holy Spirit, teach us. Open up the scriptures to us, Father. Give us revelation and an understanding of your word, Father, that we would be changed by the truth of your scripture, Father. I pray as we go into our service this morning, Father, that we would go in, Father, with an excitement, that we would go in, Father, with the realization that we have come to worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Father, that we have come, Father, to begin to worship, Father, to just, because it's not something that we do one time, Father, it's not just a singing of a song, Father, but it's entering in, Father, recognizing who you are and who you are in our lives, Father. Pray that you would move mightily, Lord. We pray for the captive to be set free, for those that are sick to be healed, for those that are, be out, have, that are bound to be loosed, Father. We're praying for miracles. We're asking you boldly, Father, to move this morning. Holy Spirit, we invite you to take over. Holy Spirit, we invite you to have your way in this service, but foremost in us, Father, that you would just move and that we would respond according to your will and direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your scripture, turn to Romans chapter 4, verse 23 through 25. We're going to finish this up um, relatively quickly and move into chapter 5. Um, chapter 4, verse 23 um, through 25 says, Now it was not written for his sake alone, but that it was imputed to him. Again, that accounting term that we have been seeing over and over throughout chapter 4. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. We have spent a great deal of time in these last four chapters. We have just kind of gone from the beginning uh, through scripture. Paul has been showing us wherever our standing, whoever we are, whether it be Jew or Gentile or whatever, that we are in desperate need of a Savior. And we're kind of bringing that to a close. God will credit righteousness to anyone who believes in him who raises Jesus our Lord from the dead. We are looking at all of this understanding that when you look at verse 23, I want you to see that, um, what there where it says, now it was not written for his sake alone. That's talking about Abraham, and that is referring back to the promise in Genesis 15, 6 that said, All he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. We are reminded again this morning that we are saved, how? With our faith in Jesus. It is not work-based, it is not performance-based, it is based only in our faith in him. And so looking at that, verse 24, for us also salvation to all who come by grace, through faith in Christ, if we believe. We spent a lot of time talking about this believing thing last week. It is not a temporary faith. It is not just a, a one and done kind of thing, but it's a steadfast, unwavering, continued, persistent faith. The Amplified puts in there where it says to believe, it says to trust in, to adhere to, to rely on. And I thought that was so well said because we are trusting in Jesus. We are holding on to him. We are depending, we are relying on him. John three fifteen that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then we look again in verse 25, who was betrayed. I want to read this to you in the Amplified because it was very good. It said, who was betrayed and put to death because of our misdeeds and was raised to secure our justification, which was our acquittal, making our account balance and absolving us from all guilt before God. 
Anybody in the room ever had a check bounce? Don't raise your hand, you might be embarrassed. I don't mind. I have, Shannon's waving at me, he might have had a few. And you understand that when you have a check bounce at the bank, it's because your account is overdrawn. So what we're saying here with all of this accounting is that we were overdrawn because of our sin. But because of the blood of Jesus, he has come in and he has filled up our account and he has balanced it out that we are no longer overdrawn with him. And only in Christ can we be made right in God's eyes. I have to tell you, and we remind ourselves all the time, we, Pastor has been sharing the last couple of weeks or maybe at least last week about being bold in our faith. Part of being bold in our faith is going to be speaking the name Jesus because it is the blood of Jesus. It is in Jesus that we are saved. And we understand that there's a world out there you can talk to about lots of things. But whenever you mention the name Jesus, it separates. There is a dividing line there. And so we recognize that. Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide <clears throat> excuse me, the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death speaking of Jesus, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You and I are those transgressors. Those, we are those that have been, um, that he died for. We understand that. A couple more things I want to give you. I uh, don't even think I want to give you that. We're going to skip. Uh, let me give you these five points as we wrap up Romans chapter 4. That we are, when we are born again, we receive new life. Christ comes to live in the new believer. Holy Spirit living in believers, giving them the power to overcome sin and to live by God's standards. Do we understand, and we've talked about that, going to be very briefly, but when we get saved, not everything in our life changes. Not everything about us changes. That's a process. That's sanctification. The Holy Spirit helps us do that. Being put right with God is a gift. No one can make himself right with God. Number three, being put right with God is grounded on the work of Jesus. Number four, being put right with God comes by his grace. We're going to talk about that. Undeserved favor. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. Number five, when we are put right with God through faith in Christ, we are crucified with Christ and Christ comes to live in us. We identify with Christ's death for our sins so that we also can identify with and receive his gift of life and his power to continually overcome our pull toward rebellion against God. Let me just remind us this morning that so many times people that are born again believers, that are trying their best to live a sanctified life, that are trying their best to do everything they know to do, struggle so much because somewhere between being saved and recognizing, I can't save myself, then we get saved and we're over here trying to live this life, we slip right back into that same thing, trying to live it ourselves. We cannot. We still need Jesus to help us. We still need the Holy Spirit to enable us to live the way we're supposed to live. Any thoughts on that before we go to chapter 5? Let me give you this. Christ's initial work of spiritual redemption, salvation, cannot be separated from the Spirit's ongoing work of spiritual sanctification, which involves purification, perfection, separation from evil, growth, and development for God's purpose. So we've got to understand, as believers, it doesn't matter whether you got saved yesterday or you got saved 50 years ago, we are still processing, we are still growing, we are still maturing. Okay, are we good there? Let's go to chapter 5. I want to read, let's read at least 1 through, maybe through 5. Chapter 5, verse 1 in Romans. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts 
by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We're going to bring out some benefits, if you will, some things that are ours because we are believers as we walk through these verses. But, you know, sometimes us Christians who have been Christians for a while, we get comfortable and we begin to take things for granted. So I want us to take just a fresh look at his grace this morning. And I've written an acronym on the board for you to just reference. But grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. We didn't, need not forget what the life we're living cost. But I want you to understand that being saved is more than a reservation in heaven. If that's all there was to it, then whenever a person got saved, God would just immediately take them out of this world because it would be done. But there is more for us to do. There is more life to be lived. And so looking in verse 1, we see immediately because we are justified, that is something past, that's something already been done, for us that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you that there is a countless number of people this morning who would give everything they had for a moment of peace. There is a world out there that is fighting tremendous battles, not only in the physical, not only in the natural, but mental battles that they struggle for peace. But you and I not only have peace with God, because we are his children, but we have the peace of God in our lives. We have peace because the salvation has made peace with God in us. In present, we know that wherever we're at, whatever our situation, that Christ is interceding for us. You know, sometimes just pause for a moment and think on that very thought because all of us have faced situations where you just didn't have the words. You just didn't know how to pray. There was just not something you could get out that you could express. And in those moments to just rest in the fact that Christ himself is interceding to the Father for us, what that means. And we have the promise of a future that one day that we will be clothed in his glory. So we have that promise. In verse 2, we see not only do we have peace, but we also, whom also we have access by faith into his grace where we stand. Oh, I love that scripture. We stand. I want you to get a picture of that because here's what he's saying. Here's the, the mental picture of that, if you will. Sometimes people of uh, position, maybe if you were uh, over in England in places where they have the king and the queen or something, you would have to have an appointment to get in to have an audience with the king. That would be just for a moment. If you were able to get in, you would go in, you would be able to speak your piece and leave. But it would be just for a set time. Do you understand that for you and I, that we literally live in the presence of the king? It is not a place that we visit. It is a place that we can dwell. Looking into that, to stand is to continue, conceived as occupying a particular state that we are secure in that. Romans 6, 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Can we shout amen this morning? Because if we were under the law, do you realize that as you were gathering your things to come to church this morning, among whatever you might have been bringing with you would have been an animal sacrifice? There would have been a need for a blood offering for an atonement, but Jesus did that for us. Galatians 2, 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for the, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So again, we recognize that we are saved by grace. Can I tell you again and again and again that we live by grace? And I want to point out that word to you. He says there, wherein we stand and rejoice. That is an interesting word. We will see it again repeated in this scripture. But it means to boast. It is kind of a, a, a almost a show off verbally. So we have something to shout about. We have something to talk about. You know, the, the scripture says that we're to be ready in season and out of season. And when people ask us the reason for our hope, we should be able to give them an answer. And that answer in a person is Jesus. That's the reason we have to boast. 
And so we get in, any thoughts on one and two before we move to three, four, and five? Because those are going to be a little sticky. Verse three says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Oh no. Anybody have any tribulation? Doesn't really make you want to shout. Most of them are not the time. It's, it's not the good news we call our, our friend and say, hey, guess what? This happened or that happened. But the scripture says that we can glory in our tribulations knowing that's the key for you and I, knowing. We always point it out and we always need to be reminded that whenever we're in something that it's going through, it didn't come to stay, it came to pass. But I want to talk to you about this as we're walking through this. The process is what we see in three and four. It's a process to prepare people for stress. Anybody got any stress? Sure we do. Can I tell you that simply having faith in Jesus, being a Christian in the world that we are living in today is stressful in itself. We are quickly seeing a decline in our own nation that once was built on Christian principles. It's no longer that way. We're seeing, as Pastor pointed out last week, I mean, the devil is no longer hiding. He is everywhere, and so we need to be prepared for that. But when we talk about tribulation, we're talking about really just means pressure. We understand pressure. It's a state of distress, an oppressive state of physical, mental, or social, or economic adversity. That pretty much sums it up. I want you to get this picture in your mind when you're speaking of, when you're thinking about pressure. It would be what would be similar to an olive oil, olive that is put in the press. They have to press that olive to get that oil out. Very similar to what would a grape would go through. Being a grape would have to be crushed, would be pressed to get the juice out of that. If you were at the ladies' meeting, Sister Carol did a phenomenal job of sharing about that grape process and about that. So, Sister Carol, to put you on the spot, where does the best juice come from? The best juice in the grape, do you remember? You said it. <laughs> it was from the grapes that were not pampered. Remember? <laughs> it was the ones who had been some tribulation. They had been through some... Yes, there you go. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's coming to her. So we understand that there is a purpose for the pain in our lives. There's a purpose. I want you to know as God's children, you know, he doesn't cause th bad things to happen in our lives. However, he does allow that. We have to recognize that as a child of God, everything that happens in our lives, good, bad, and ugly, is filtered through the hands of the Father. It is first passed through his hands. And some that's, sometimes that's hard for us to digest. And people will all the time ask you, well, why would a loving God let this happen or let that happen or whatever? We have to understand that God's ways are higher than ours and that he is always working a better purpose. He is working from the eternal side. You and I are looking at the temporal side that this hurts and I want it to stop. God is looking at saying that there's something greater in this, that there is fruit to bear coming out of this. So there is something to be said for that. Pastor Johnson from First Assembly used to always tell us that God will bring you through anything if you can stand the squeeze. And, that, and that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where it gets difficult. What was that, Sister Dawn? I hear you talking. Meaning the same. God will pull you through if you can stand the pull. So we look at that. So he says that he will bring it, that the tribulation brings forth patience, and patience brings forth experience, and experience hope. That patience is a steadfast endurance. Let me tell you a definition. The power to withstand hardship or, or stress, especially the inward fortitude necessary. Where does that come from? That's not us. That's God working in us, but he gives us the ability to hold on during the pull, to stand the pull, to stand the squeeze, to get through that. And when he speaks of experience, what is that? That is dependability. You know, I heard, and some of you may know who Dave Reaver is, 
Uh, he was a Vietnam veteran who was badly scarred, literally lost. Anyway, you'll just have to look him up if you don't know who he is. But he said in going through all of that on the other side, he said the one thing that God spoke to him when he was trying to figure it all out and understand why all this happened, God said, I can trust you with the scars. And I thought, that's powerful. That's powerful. Because God allows these things because he's believing in us to get on the other side of that. Experience, dependability, the quality of being proven to be dependable or reliable. That's what he was saying. Hope, and he speaks of bringing us a hope. Not only is there so many people in the world today that have no peace, there's a whole world of people that have no hope. Hope is necessary to life. It is almost as necessary as the air we breathe. Hope is the general feeling that some desire will be filled. When a man loses hope, he loses everything. And that's where you see so many people that are taking their own lives today and why it is so tragic for anyone to take their life. But when you look at young people and getting younger all the time that are making these choices and you're thinking, what is it in their life that is causing them to make the choice? I'm not so sure that it's what is in their life as what is not in their life. And somewhere they have come to the point and said, this is it. It is not going to get any better than this. There is no hope for tomorrow. I'm done. And they check out. Hope is necessary. Process means to stay under. You and I have to believe that whatever circumstance and situation that we are in, that it will end well. You need to tell yourself that sometimes. We need to remind ourselves sometimes this will end well. Because what happens is in the natural, our flesh, whenever we get under pressure, how do you respond? Not, not your Christian answer, not your Sunday school answer, but when we're feeling the pressure of the moment, when life is just hard, what is our natural response to that? Anybody? Well, we think the worst. Isolation, we withdraw. We panic. Anger, we get angry. This is not fair. I don't deserve this. Mine is to run. I'm a fight or flee kind of person. I want to run. Anybody else? We whine. Oh, we want to know why. We probably whine too. But we want to know why. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our experience not only helps us, but it helps the people that God places in our lives. And isn't there a scripture that talks about sometimes we go through things so that with the comfort that we have received, we can comfort someone else? Brother Stanley.
good. Absolutely, absolutely. Because so often, and we need to be reminded, and I've said this to you before, probably just a couple of weeks ago, trusting God means trusting the process. We can't quit in the middle. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and all of you know it, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, most gladly, therefore, will I will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Exactly what Brother Stanley just said. It's not in ourselves. It's not even in our ability to help someone else. But it's in what Christ is doing in us. Him being the one who reaches out down to pick us up. Our trials of faith, they're productive, if we cooperate with the process. The story was told of a small cotton town many years ago that the town was a small poor town, but they made a living based on their cotton crops and very dependent on these cotton crops. And so one year uh, before cotton season or in whenever it happened that they were invaded by bow weevils who came in and literally destroyed everything that they had, all of their crops. I mean, they're looking at total loss. I mean, there, there's nothing left. But out of this devastation, they decided somehow that they were going to no longer plant cotton, that they would begin to plant peanuts. And so they did, and they were very successful at that. And what happened is they made way more money off of the peanuts than they were making off of the cotton. So what had been evil was now good, and because of that, I mean, they celebrated in such a manner, wherever this town is, they have a giant statue of a bow weevil to remember and I think sometimes we can go back to those places in our lives and realize, just as Joseph said, what the devil, what you meant for evil, God has turned for good. We have to go back to what I said to you in the very beginning. God has an expected end for us, and that expected end is not to fall out under the trial, but to process through the trial and to come out with more character and experience on the other side that we have something to share with the people around us because it makes a difference. You know, somebody can come up to you, as Sister Carol said and mentioned ago, I want to go back to that, because someone can come up to you and say, you know what, I'm really sorry you're walking through this and I'm praying for you and that's all well and good. But if someone else comes up to you and says, you know what, I'm really sorry that you're going through this and I'm praying for you and I'm a living testimony that there is life on the other side of this, that I have been there and I have survived and I am better for it, how much more does that mean? It's something we can get a hold of. We can say, well, they made it, I can make it too. So we look at that, that our faith is productive, not just in us, but in others. Looking at character, it says it produces character, experience, which is tried integrity. Can I tell you this morning that there are no shortcuts to good character? There are no shortcuts to integrity. That is something that we have to walk out. Any thoughts on that before we go to verse 5? i got to go back to verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That, that phrase, shed abroad, means to be poured. I want you to get a picture of that. His love is poured into our hearts, to be poured out, to become expressed without restraint, conceived as a being or becoming poured out. Because of his love in us, we have the power to love others. I want you to think about that. I want to give that to you in some lyrics that I found from a song written by Bill Gaither that says, the name of the song is I Am Loved. And it says, I am loved, I am loved. I can risk loving you. For the one who knows me best loves me most. I am loved, you are loved. Won't you please take my hand? We are free to love each other. We are loved. Forgiven, I can dare to love my brother. 
forgiven, I reach out to take your hand. I am loved by the one who knows me best. So I want you to think about that. And I came across something this week, and I'm certain that it was something that I needed to be reminded of, but I wanted to share it with you this morning because it fits here. True Christian maturity is not measured just in how we love Jesus, but also in how we love Judas. I want you to think about the truth of that scripture. Because till the very end, Jesus still loved Judas. Even though he knew when he washed the feet of the disciples, Judas was there. He washed the feet of the one that would betray him. When he met him in the garden and Judas approached him with the kiss of a friend, Jesus still, one more time, hope against hope, that he would change his mind. He loved him. So it is very easy for you and I to love the people that love us. That is never difficult. But the ones who spitefully use you, the ones who are mean and, and unloving to you, that's where our test of, of Christian maturity comes in. Verses 6 through 9. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely, and that's very good. And you are 100% that we are to love, not judge. That it's a matter of the heart. And here's those kind of things. You know, you can, we can hide a lot of stuff. I mean, we can look good for each other. But we are reminded over and over in Scripture that God knows the hearts. He knows what we're really thinking. He knows what we're really feeling. And so we have to look at that. I want to give you these last verses and then I want to read a little story to you before we go. Verses 5 through, I don't know, 6. Let's start in 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The overwhelming love of God. I want you to understand, it is as just what Rob just said, it is very easy for us to look at a certain person or a certain crime or a certain type of people and think, well, they deserve what they get. But we cannot ever do that without being reminded of who we were when Jesus died for us. And scripture tells us that we were without strength, that we were ungodly, that we were sinners, that we were spared from the wrath of God. Who is going to receive the wrath of God? The enemies of God. So we were enemies of him, and yet he was willing to die for us. Without strength, we were powerless. He commended his love toward us. He loved the unlovable. We can do no less. When we think about the grace that we've received, 
we must understand that the grace received is the same grace that we're to extend. It's the same grace that we're to give. I want to read you, let me find it, this story about Peter Miller. Before I do, any other comments on that? Don, did you have something you wanted to say? You had that look. Anybody else? I want to make sure. Okay. All right. Carry on. Peter Miller was a minister in the German Reformed Church in his early life. He came to America as a minister of this church in 1730. He preached at various points. He served as pastor of Bethany Reformed Church. He moved to a small town in Pennsylvania, settled there, and became the pastor. He resided there during the American Revolutionary War. He enjoyed the personal acquaintance of General Washington. Peter Miller was a talented and highly educated man. At the, requ at the request of Thomas Jefferson, he translated the Declaration of Independence into seven foreign languages and helped in this way to explain to the world the reason for the American Revolution. Michael Whitman also resided in this same town and who now secured an inviolable note. In he was a deacon, nonetheless, in the German Reformed Church. The withdrawal of Peter Miller from that church greatly incensed Whitman, who now secured an unviable notoriety for his abuse of Miller and the Seven-day Baptist. On one occasion, he struck Miller in the face. On another occasion, he spit in his face. Miller endured it all with Christian fortitude. He never spoke a cross word or to or against Whitman for his shameful conduct. Due to different circumstances, he was charged with treason. Mr. Whitman was charged with treason. He was taken to General Washington. There he was tried for treason, found guilty, and sentenced to hang. How after, however, after this death sentence was passed, Peter Miller arose early in the morning, took his cane and set out on foot through the snow to visit General Washington at Valley Forge to intercede for the life of Whitman. Remember, this is the man that had unmercifully persecuted him. He was told that his prayer for his friend could not be granted. My friend, exclaimed Miller, I have not a worse enemy living than this man. What, rejoined Washington, you have walked 60 miles to save the life of your enemy? That, in my judgment, puts the matter in a different light. I will grant you this pardon. The pardon was signed, written, signed by General Washington and handed to Miller, who at once set out for Westchester, 15 miles distance, where the execution was set to take place on the afternoon that same day. He arrived just as Whitman was being carried into the scaffold, who, seeing Miller in the crowd, remarked, There is old Peter Miller. He has walked all the way from wherever to have his revenge gratified today, seeing me hung. These words were scarcely spoken when Miller waved the pardon and commanded them to halt. That is such a beautiful illustration of the love of God for you and I, that we were guilty, condemned to die, and Jesus with his blood comes waving our pardon. That we have been reconciled to him, and I will close with verse 10 and 11. For if we, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Any thoughts before we go? We're going to dismiss with those scriptures. God bless y'all. Thank you for your faithfulness to Sunday school. We appreciate y'all.